Hey, how's it going? I'm Nick, the host of the Echo Academy podcast, a podcast where we share the tools and strategies that make life better. This series is all about the road less traveled. And my guest is Peter Lawrence. Peter is a Singaporean who was working in the Valley before retiring at 44 to fully pursue the minimalist and nomadic lifestyle. Through my conversation with him, I found that he is someone who is deeply reflective and intentional, which might be a result of his minimalism or just his nature. But the answer to my last question to him is probably one of the simplest yet most powerful advice I've heard throughout this series. So I hope you enjoy this conversation because I learned a lot from it and I'm sure you will too. So where in the world are you now, by the way? I'm in Mexico. It's uh, there's a small town called Ajijic, and that's where I am. And how, how how long how long do you plan to be there? Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask you about that, actually. Like, I mean, how has your nomadic life kind of been since COVID, you know? I mean, how has the travel or, or, or life when you are in a specific place, like what's your experience? What has your experience been so far? So my experience, I mean, there's, no, has, there's not been any major difference in my experience. Um, you know, there. Sometimes I wonder myself. I mean, my elder brother kind of <laughs> mentioned to me that I'm I have this restless heart, right? Always moving. But <laughs> when this pandemic hit, I I was okay with just staying put. You know, so in a sense, I'm kind of uh, happy with myself that when I need to move, I can move, and if I need to sit put, I'll sit put, right? So it hasn't really affected me that much. Gotcha. And why why do you think that is though? I mean, in your in your brother's words, um, you have a restless heart, but it seems like you, you well, you're com- you're comfortable now. Well, so it's all relative, right? Because my brother is stable in the sense that he lives yeah. in Singapore all the time. Whereas <laughs> in my case, I've always been out. And even when I'm out, I'm, I keep moving. So, yes, so from his point of view, uh, he may seem as restless, right? As I said, it's relative. But I, And I asked myself the question, too, uh, whether, whether I am restless. In fact, it, it, a friend of mine, an Australian friend of mine, he lent me a book uh, called Anatomy of Restlessness. It was written by Bruce uh, Chadwin, I think. And in that, the author actually brings up an interesting point. He says this uh, nomadic uh, tendencies is actually in all of us. It just exhibits in a different way. And he goes on to give examples that even going on pilgrimage to some extent is kind of fulfilling these uh, tendencies, right? Yeah, it's it's interesting that you bring that up because, you know, I, when I was, I mean, I'm I'm 33 now. When I was in my 20s, that's all I could think about doing, you know, like traveling mm-hmm. and 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 experiencing. And I and and I did quite a bit of that actually. And now it seems like I want. I mean, I want to travel, but in almost in the same way you are experiencing it now. 
in the sense that you know you're somewhere else but you're experiencing it for a long period of time to really acclimatize to a different life a different culture um so i mean that's kind of how i see uh, my restlessness i don't know mm -hmm. if you can relate yeah 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 and 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 i think you know even before we get into the lifestyle that you lead lead now you know we're going to talk about you know how you retired at 44 you know you decided to live a minimalist lifestyle and also a nomadic one but maybe mm -hmm. maybe just so that our listeners can really get a understanding of who you are maybe you can tell me a little bit more about your background you know all the way leading up to maybe your move to san francisco okay so I was born and raised in Singapore. My accent still remained. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and uh, I went to Catholic schools, SJI, CJC, and then on to national service. During my time, it was two and a half years. So today's generation is more fortunate. They save half a year. And then after national service, further studies and work, and let's not forget the mandatory regular IPPs and reservist trainings. So that was my life up to the point I left Singapore. Nothing out of the ordinary. And what, what made you leave Singapore? Well, uh, very. I don't think I told this to anyone, any of my family members or close friends then. Since young, I always had this desire to get out of Singapore. And uh, US was actually not my first choice. My first choice was New Zealand. Uh, beautiful country, beautiful people, but hard to emigrate. And I went on a business trip to the US. I was there for two weeks in Covales, Oregon. And I just got to like the people and the country and I decided I'm going to try to get to the U.S. And three years later, I did. Yeah. How, how, how did it all happen? I mean, was it a case of, you know, hunting for jobs there or just going there and then yeah. figuring it out? What was no, the process? So, so the process was I was working for HP in Singapore. And fortunately, my role um, required me to deal with people from uh, North America, Europe, uh, Japan, and uh, yeah, and Australia. So through that, through, through those communications, I got to know people from all regions well. And interestingly, and, and the, all of them, at least the North American and the European counterparts of mine, knew that I wanted to, uh, I was willing to work uh, God, right? So right. when an opportunity in the US came up, I just grabbed it. I mean, it's not, it's not easy as you wanting to go and then they take you, right? Because they have to interview local candidates first and then actually show that they can't find someone suitable before they can bring you in because you know relocation is costly and then they have to justify to the uh, immigration that I, they have to bring me in, right? So yeah. anyway, that's how it kind of happened. Yeah. And, and what year was this? I left Singapore in 1997. 1997. And... and were you in uh, San Francisco the whole time? No, actually, it's not San Francisco. It's, it's called the San Francisco Bay Area. My work was in Cupertino, but I lived in Santa Clara, which is, you know, just about two miles away. Right. Okay. And so, so then how did the the nomadic lifestyle or the minimal, minimalist, or maybe we can start with the minimalist. How did that minimalist lifestyle come to be how did you get into that philosophy when you were in you know the u.s yes. well it actually started even beyond that so i i come from a modest family and as such it kind of is ingrained in you to some extent but yeah. interestingly 
you know, when when we grew up, I continued in that path. <laughs> yeah. My siblings did not. And I just began fine-tuning the whole thing. And what I think uh, prompted me even further in the direction was um, when HP bought Compaq, I had to move to Houston uh, for work. And because it was a company initiated move, I, uh, you know, the company paid for the, the relocation. And after two years in, I mean, I, of course, I preferred uh, California compared to Texas. So I always wanted to kind of return. And in the final job in uh, Texas, when I took it up, I made a deal with my boss uh, that I be able to work out from California because I would have to deal with both people from Houston as well as uh, uh, Cupertino. And she agreed. But then she said, since you are, you are the one who wants to move, you have to move at your own cost. Gotcha. So that actually forced me to look all to look at the things that I own and I simplified everything such that I was able to put everything I own into my compact size car. And I just drove from Houston back to Santa Clara. Right? Wow. Everything in my car. And uh, I mean, it's it's a great feeling. It it just makes you more efficient, right? Yeah. And then that you know, as time went on, I just kept improving, improving, improving. So when when this nomadic lifestyle began, I can't. I it has no longer have to fit in a car. It has to fit in a carry on size luggage, right? Yeah. And that's what I did. Right. And it. You know, it's funny because I first came across your story from Kristen's uh, YouTube yeah. channel, which is which is an amazing channel as well. And when when I saw the video of your house and you know the the minimalist format, you know, I I remember thinking, you know, because you talked about you know how you know you can turn on the projector and face it towards the right. wall when when your friends come along. But I was thinking to myself, where do they sit? Because there was no like real furniture apart from the Correct. sleeping Correct. bag. So how did how, how how did your friends feel about it? How did the people around you feel about it, especially when you welcome them to your home or when you tell them about this? Wow. And and they're comfortable just sleeping on the floor, just, you know, kind of living yeah, so the life. The, most of them uh, bring their own sleeping bag. And I, mean, I have one extra sleeping bag. So if they don't have, then they, they use mine. I love it. That's fantastic. <laughs> so, so what made you then decide, you know, to, to retire and you know, at age 44 and and pursue this, you know, nomadic lifestyle? Yeah, so the clarification I need to make is I did not retire to a nomadic lifestyle. I retired in 2008 mm -hmm. and this nomadic journey only began in 2015. Right? All so right, okay. I just want to clarify that. To answer your first question, again, just like since young, I wanted to always leave Singapore. Since young... <laughs> Yeah. Well, maybe not as young as wanting to live Singapore, but there was a certain 
uh, I, I guess even before I started working, I had this notion that I'm not going to work till 55 or 65, I was going to retire young, right? And once I started working, it just propelled me even further because if you want to really do a good job, it really takes a lot out of you, right? So yeah. I spent a lot of time, I mean, during my working years, I, I spent a lot of time and energy on work because it really, if you want, as I said, if you want to do a good job, it really drains a lot out of you. So I, as I said, it just gave me more incentive to stick to my plan on retiring young, right? And I did not have that goal of that I want to retire at 44. It just so happened that um, I, I, I started uh, working on my book and by the time I finished it, I became convinced that this was the time for me to leave. And that's, where, that's when I, I left. Right. And I'm curious, when was there a financial goal you set for yourself in order to retire, or was it um, was it something that you know you just felt comfortable at that particular time, perhaps at age forty four or something? Um, no, to make it has nothing. Of- yeah, it, it, it's not so much the the um, the guidance was not so much on the age, the whatever I had. And what I needed was kind of the uh, the decision factor, but I didn't have a specific number either, right? I think maybe a better way to illustrate this might be, did you ever read the book Moneyball or uh, watch the movie Moneyball? I, think I, watched, I watched the movie, but I didn't read the book. Okay. So the concept, the many people may have watched it, but may have missed out on the most important point there, which is the, this guy, I think his name was Billy Bean. It has been many years ago, so I can't remember the facts, but this guy, Billy Bean, he has a limited budget, right? And he has to compete against all these other teams that has huge budgets. How is he going to compete? And so he, together with the other guys, they actually dissect the whole game and realize that certain things that actually helps you win the game, that certain attributes are undervalued, right? And certain values that, certain attributes that actually really doesn't help you win the game are overpriced or overvalued, right? Mm -hmm. So by taking advantage of that, right? They came up with the algorithm and then they, they, they pursued that and they were able to win even with a limited budget. Yeah. So it was, it's just, it was kind of the same with me. I, I asked myself, you know, from a very young age, what really matters in life, right? And how much do we really need? And once you break it down that way, you, re- you realize you actually don't really don't need that much. Right? And so that kind of gave me the confidence that, you know, I was okay or I was comfortable retiring at that age. Yeah. And, you know, that's a good point. And I want to focus in a little bit on that uh, before we move on to the next question. Mm-hmm. I- I'm curious, um, what, what is... Um, what is... What is the basics that you need and, and what are the things that are important for your for you in your life? Correct. Right. So I over the years I kind of uh, fine-tuned the four things that I kind of focus on. So when it comes to other than anything of these four aspects, I'm totally clueless. Right. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, in, in fact one Christmas, I remember my friends had to explain to me about the Kardashians. And even after all the explanation, I still couldn't understand what was the big deal. 
Anyway. <laughs> I don't think any, so, many people can understand either. <laughs> yeah. So the four things I kind of identified as important, at least you know, this is to me, was spiritual health, mental health, physical health, and financial health. Right? As long as I have control or have a good grasp on this, I'll be fine. Right? The rest of the thing is not important. Gotcha. What would you say that like these are set in stone? Like these are your, this is the compass that you guide your life with? Exactly. Exactly. And all four of these in some ways interact, right? So as an example, if you're physically healthy, then you'll be financially healthy too because you won't be spending money on prescription drugs, medications, surgeries, or anything of that sort, right? So in, in that case, you know, I think that's a great segue to like the next question that I have. And that is, you know, what is it about this minimalist lifestyle and then maybe the nomadic lifestyle that you personally find fulfilling? Yeah, so first on minimalism, to me, minimalism is just a more efficient way of living. Why use more resources when you can do with less? An efficient machine uses less fuel than one that is not efficient. A physically fit person tend to have a lower resting heart rate than someone who is not fit. So when you are healthy in mind, body, and spirit, we wouldn't need stuff. And if we do, we will use less of it. And by living efficiently, I do not only personally benefit, but is better for the environment too. And as far as nomadic lifestyle is concerned, it's more of a consequence of me wanting to take advantage of the benefits of geographical arbitrage, my eagerness to explore different places and cultures. My, I must point out my nomadic lifestyle is different from that portrayed in the movie Nomadland. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> my nomadic lifestyle is also different from digital nomads. In both of these cases, they are working, whereas in my case, I'm not. And yeah. I think, finally, I think it's also important to point out that geographical arbitrage is possible in my case because I earned my income in developed countries and am exploring and living in emerging economy. So the cost difference makes it worthwhile. If someone was born, raised, and is working in these emerging economies, geographical arbitrage, even if it is an option, the advantages may not be that pronounced. So it is not lost on me that I'm fortunate, right, to be able to make use of it. Yeah, I would say that's the that's the distinct difference um, between your lifestyle and the one portrayed in Nomadland, right? Because I think Nomadland, you see them actually financially struggling, struggling because they're right. living nomadic lifestyle because they cannot afford the basic necessities that you know one can be afforded, the one should be afforded. So, correct and. I actually, uh, before Kirsten came out with my second uh, video, I mean, this was one of the things that I was kind of uh, sharing with her about is some of these people, they are, I mean, I, I guess their age group, they, they are already receiving social security, some of them. And... I wonder, right, if they know that there's an option such as Mexico or other country where with their social security, they will be able to live okay, right? Um, so I, I always wondered about that. And, and I'm sure there will be some group of uh, people in that category that if they know that such an option was available, they might actually consider it. 
Yeah. And I, I think it's a bit of a mix, right? There's the, there are people who genuinely don't know that there is that ge ge geographical arbitrage. Correct. But, but I think there are some, just like, you know, some of us in Singapore, you know, sometimes myself included, where we're just comfortable where we are. And even if we struggle True. in our True. current location, we're comfortable with the struggle because we fear what yes. is elsewhere. So I think it's a mix, right, between the two. Yeah, I mean, it's the case of the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know, right? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Especially the older you get, right? Because you're so comfortable in that suffering, so to speak. So what are, what are some of the challenges you experience in the, with the lifestyle you lead now? So the biggest challenge with nomadic lifestyle is finding a suitable place to live that meets your cost criteria as well as the as well as your quality criteria so based on my experience at least among the places places i have traveled to most of the time there is excess capacity when it comes to hotel rooms most hotels are mostly empty most of the time and are filled only during holidays or some special events. So if you are an astute hotel owner, you should know the marginal cost of having an additional guest. And as long as the guest is willing to pay more than the marginal cost, the hotel owner should welcome you. But most hotel managers don't. They will take their daily rate multiply it by 30 days and give it to you and give a monthly rate to you. Some may give you a discount, but still not enough to get me in. Right. Only a few understand the value of having a long-term guest and offer me a rate that appeals to me. And I try to educate them on the marginal costs, not only for my personal benefit, but for their benefit too, but to no avail. I won't be surprised that many of these places are losing money. At least one of them admitted to me he was losing money. And, and my comments apply to the smaller hotels and not to the large chain. That's, um, it's funny you say that because, I mean, I'm putting myself in the shoes of the, the small hotelier and and thinking, you know, if a guest were to come and tell me something like that, the first thing I would think of is not so much that, you know, I'm making some gains, but rather that, you know, he's trying to take advantage of the fact that I have <laughs> low occupancy. <laughs> and, you know, he's trying. Because, you know, it's, I mean, the idea of, you know, marginal cost and, uh, you know, a cost of, cost per client or visitor you know, these things, uh, you know, are secondary to just, you know, their daily survival for, especially the really small ones. But I'm curious right. what your experience was like. Well, so you are right, right? I mean, it's, it's a very difficult uh, concept to kind of, uh, I mean, okay, it is an easy concept, but it's not, uh, it's not something that can be conveyed in a way that they will fully appreciate it. And which is sad because I can tell you, they are losing a lot of opportunity. I mean, I wouldn't say losing a lot of opportunity, but they are leaving money on the table, right? And, and I think if, if there was some sort of way to kind of educate them, <laughs> they will actually benefit. They will really benefit. I mean, the, the hotel guy that told me that he was losing money, he had a fantastic echo lodge in, uh, in Panama. And it's sad that he's losing money because eventually at some point, I think what will end up happening is the bank will just take over, right? right. And right. It, it's a sad case. And, I, and this is the thing that I noticed about um, Latin America and... I mean, even in Vietnam, right, when it comes yeah. to hotel, anything is people are running business without um, 
sufficient knowledge to kind of really, uh, you know, maximize what they could. And apart from, apart from that, right? Like, you know, really maximizing that geographical arbitrage. What about? And maybe I'm just transferring my what my anticipated feelings would be. But if I were to live a lifestyle like that, I would think about maybe the the loneliness, or maybe even perhaps the idea that you know there's no. I don't actually have my my foot or my feet firmly planted somewhere. You know, there's no place I actually call home, and you know these are things I would be thinking about. Is this something you think about too, or is this not so important? No, so <laughs> it's a uh, it's uh, this is a thing that kind of comes up, uh, especially the first part of it, the loneliness uh, part of it. And uh, okay, let me give you so that the, the the short answer is no, but I want to I want to kind of provide you the context uh, so that you know both you and the audience may maybe uh, appreciate it. Better. Yeah, please. So when I relocated to the US from Singapore, my I went I I came alone. My family members did not come with me, nor did my friends from Singapore, right? So after I retired, whether I live, I continue to live in California or move around does not make much difference as far as the dynamics with my Singapore family members and friends are concerned. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. So... I mean, why I'm kind of bringing this up is people miss, uh, you know, you, you kind of take things at surface level, but then if you really, again, right, you uh, feel it, right, you'll actually find there's not much difference. And with regards to friends, whether it's in the US or Singapore, what is interesting is this, right? I have been the reason more than once, why my friends came together, right, to meet, without which they may not have come together as a group, right? Because I'm there only for a short time, whether it's back in the States or in Singapore, there's some incentive for them to kind of come together. Whereas when you are in the same place, right, you always kind of uh, delay, right? Yeah. And you never, you never end up uh, meeting. I think the, the point is our lives are filled with work and immediate family affairs that regular meet up with friends does not occur consistently, right? Yeah. Now, another thing to consider uh, when you were in the national service, did you ever go overseas, like um, Taiwan or Brunei? I mean, were you sent on any overseas? Uh, uh, no, I, di I didn't. Okay. But you know people who have? Yes, I do. I do, okay. of course. And usually it's like a few weeks, few days or a few weeks, right? Yeah. Do you know of any national service man who did it for more than six months? Um, yeah, I had a friend who who was permanently based in Brunei for at least a year of his national service. Uh, yeah.
I suppose snail mail. <laughs> exactly, right? Snail mail. And most of the permanent staff were actually regulars. Uh, regulars meaning they have signed on. I mean, they they are not uh, national service men like us. Yeah, that's that's your permanent. That's your career. So most of them were regulars, and and as you know, right? Regulars earn much more than the national service men do. Yeah. So regulars could afford at that time to at least make a overseas call. And to make an overseas call, you can't make it from the camp. They so I I got to know. A sergeant became a close friend of mine, and you and he was married. And before before he made the call, because the calls are expensive, yeah. he will actually write down what he's actually going to speak to his wife about, <laughs> and then re and rehearse rehearse several times. And then, as I said, you couldn't make the call at the camp. We have to during our off days, which comes about twice a month, we take the bus to Taipei, which is about I think forty minutes, right? And then we go to a post office, a major post office that has this telephone, and then he pays it, and then they assign you a booth, and then he rehearses again, <laughs> and then he makes the call at the at the time that. He told his wife pre in his previous call when he was going to call next, right? Yeah. And then he has to go and he has to do it in such a way such that he gives his wife ample time for her to share what she has to share, right? And sometimes the phone clicks because you know there's not enough time. Yeah. And at least he got to make the call. National service man, we never. I mean, it will it will take up a lot of our money to make that call, right? Yeah. So, the coming back to the current time, how fortunate are we? Whenever you miss someone, you can just call, and not only you can hear the person's voice on the other side. But also to be able to see the person. How fortunate are we, right? Yeah. And we have to. So the question is, do you think? So scenario A, right? The current scenario where you can just call and talk to someone. Scenario B, you. Um, the only way you communicate is through snail mail. And when you send the mail, you do not even know when the person is going to receive it, or even if the person <laughs> actually receives it, right? Yeah. And you wait, you wait in anticipation, right, for the reply. So, where do you think? In which scenario do you think the love is going to be stronger? The post now, right, with the, all this communication readily so available. You, you, so you think the present uh, situation will make the love stronger? So what about the saying, "absence makes a heart grow fonder"? I suppose you know, and I mean, the thing is, I've never experienced both, so I wouldn't be able to to think about it. But I, I'm 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 thinking about it from the sense of, you know, I mean, yeah, sure, if um, if it's if it's like maybe your 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 wife, like the the sergeant or your family member, I suppose absence makes the heart grow fonder. But for friends or maybe even if it's just a significant other that you just started dating, for example, maybe it's the case of out of sight, out of mind, right? Because you are where you are. So I, I I'm kind of split, but I can appreciate as well. I think what what I I take away from that is. During the days of snail mail, we could, at the very least, calibrate our emotions because, you know, you think about it. Let's say you write someone and you say, like, you know, I'm, I had a very bad day. This was a tough day. I'm just thinking about you. And you send it off, and you get a mail one month later, and you're like, 
what was the bad day about? You know, I can't even remember. So, <laughs> so, so I guess yeah. in that sense, you know, there's some calibration. You kind of appreciate that all of this is fleeting. Whereas now, yes. because everything is so, you know, you can just connect with someone. You every I don't know everything. You 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 don't prioritize what's important. You just kind of let fly everything that's on your mind but and um sorry uh, a few other points on this topic because yeah. this is something that i've kind of you know thought about and kind of rationalized yeah tell um, me please Yeah. And it's so true because, I mean, I'm reflecting on my personal experience. I'm very comfortable being alone. But at the same time, I'm comfortable because I can distract myself. But it's always, it's always a challenge. It's always a practice and discipline to really sit down and observe rather than to distract and so I can relate to that. And, you know, I can also see that I'm, you know, part of the problem as well. So, yeah, I, I definitely appreciate that statement. There was actually an experiment done by a guy. I forgot which university he was from. And it, it's, I mean, at first glance, it seemed hilarious. So he got people to come and sit in a room uh, by themselves. And in one scenario, there was an option to kind of give themselves a shock, you know, like an electric shock. I mean, not, in, not, not enough to kill them, but just to give them a, like a boost. Yeah. <laughs> and there was a significant percentage of people, like within 20 minutes, they just couldn't see. They gave, a, they, they gave themselves a shock. <laughs> wow. And, and and that right there is the plight of 
of human existence, right? Just the inability to be, to just be, we must experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, what does the future hold for you, Peter? Like, is this, is, do you, do you plan to continue with this, you know, geographical arbitrage, this nomadic lifestyle, or do you see yourself being a minimalist, but settling down in one place? Yeah, so another Mexican friend of mine recently told me, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> yeah. Or as Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with that in mind, uh, my current plan is to head to Singapore later this year or next year. My mom, though, is healthy, is getting old, so it'll be good to spend more time with her. Beyond that, I have no concrete plans. No matter what I end up doing, I will continue to be a minimalist. Yeah. As far as whether I'll be nomadic, I don't know. I have already lived in places of eternal spring that I wanted to live in. Yeah. Uh, one possible exploration in the future could be some cities in the Eastern Europe. And if that comes to fruition, then my nomadic lifestyle may resume, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's where it is right now. You know, Peter, I must say that listening to what the things you say, you, you sound very comfortable with yourself. Was this something that took you a while to get to this point or was this something that was always you? So, my final question to you, I mean, using your experience, what, what do you think is the value of uncommon experiences? Yeah, so I, I kind of approach it uh, perhaps differently. So, to me, the value comes not from the fact that it is uncommon but from the merits of the experience itself, irrespective of whether it is common or uncommon. Mm -hmm. I do not choose to do things because they are unique, but because they make sense to me. It just so happened that the many of the roads that I have chosen happen to be less traveled. When I, I retired when I was 44 years old, only 1% of the US population retire under 50. But being in the 1% was not my motivation for retiring. When I retired, I did not personally know anyone that had retired in their 40s, but that did not deter me either. So what I'm trying to say is that something being uncommon did not deter or motivate me from doing what I wanted to do. The value of early retirement to me was it enabled me to improve in areas I wanted to improve? And one reason early retirement was possible was because of my minimalist lifestyle, which happens to be uncommon too. But I still pursued it because of its many benefits, early retirement being one of them. I published my book, The Happy Minimalist, in 2008 because there was no book on minimalism at that time. At least, I did not come across any. Since then, many books have been published on this topic. 
And the authors who published after me are spending a lot of time and money promoting their books, which gives me the sense that minimalism is getting more recognition, which goes to show that even if something is uncommon when you do it, if there is value in it, it will slowly become more common. Years ago, a Singaporean girl told me that girls don't find minimalism attractive. But shortly after that, someone brought to my attention a blog called The Happy Minimalist Girl. So there's at least one girl who finds it attractive. <laughs> and if there's one, eventually there will be more. So the value of pursuing the uncommon experience then is not only I personally benefit, but hopefully it also serves as an inspiration for others to follow such that what was uncommon becomes common and what was thought to be unachievable becomes achievable. So 1954, Doctors and scientists said that running a mile under four miles will kill you. After Dr. Roger Bannister proved that wrong, he said, the main obstacle to achieving the impossible may be a self-limiting mindset. And true enough, once that mindset changed, others began to achieve it too. And Finally, one other value of uncommon experience is that once you have succeeded in finding the value in an uncommon experience, you become a serial uncommon experiencer. Because it gives you the confidence. If you have achieved something before that is uncommon, the next time you wish to pursue something that is uncommon, you will pursue it with more wow that's really powerful that's a, a great answer to that question i really enjoyed that no, so so yeah pete i guess when you do come back to singapore i'd love to meet you in person you know? oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> but uh you know no pressure you know as you say where the wind blows <laughs> yeah, yeah. um peter it was a pleasure speaking to you today i really enjoyed this conversation and i i hope people who listen to this episode get something valuable out of it i hope so too thanks for having me no problem i will also put a a link to to your book, uh, which I guess you can get from Amazon still, right? Am I right? Yeah, you can get from Amazon. You can also get it from Apple Bookstore, Barnes and Nobles, and Kobo. Any any electronic ones, uh, you should be able to get it. Sounds good. Uh, I'll put the link up so if people are interested, they can check it out as well. 